So without further ado, please welcome Joanna Rutkowska. Okay, so I want to talk about trust today. Um, when, we, when we think trust in the context of computer security, we usually associate it with these other three words, trusted, secure, and trustworthy. And many people think they are kind of synonyms, which they really are not. They really are not because really what trusted means is by definition, this is something that can ruin the security of your whole system. Which means we do not like things that are trusted. Like trusted third party. That means that your, 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 your fate is in your hands. Not good, right? Um, so this presentation is going to be about how to minimize the amount of things that we consider trusted. The word secure, at least for me, I define it to mean essentially resistant to attacks. But that does not necessarily mean that it must be good for, for you, a user, for example, or whoever. Because um, malware can be securely written too. Secure, secure usually means well written like malware without having bugs and without with using strong authentication would be a pretty secure malware. Or, or we can call it remote administration uh, toolkit also. Right? But not necessarily good for users or some users. Trustworthy, finally, would be something that is secure and also good, whatever that good might really mean, which might be different depending on the political and, and social, whatever context. But generally, we want systems to be trustworthy, not trusted. So TCB is a, is a, is a, is a, um, a key uh, um, concept in, in operating system or computer system design. It means trusted computing base which essentially means all the code and firmware and hardware that we sadly were forced to trust as otherwise, if it turned out not to be uh, good, it would ruin our whole security. So TCBs we don't really like. We, we, we want systems without TCBs, which is not really possible. So at least we would like to ensure minimal amount of TCBs in our systems. Okay. So um, let's take a look at some practical um, examples. First, a classic example of a typical modern uh, a client operating system. Uh, during this presentation, when I say client operating system or desktop operating system or laptop, endpoint, this is all synonyms. Essentially, this is the device that the end user uses as an extension of the user's brain. So, holds all the secrets of the user. So, this is a typical. It's a picture of a typical contemporary operating system like Windows or OS X uh, or Linux. These are all monolithic operating systems. Even the, uh, the Mac OS X is monolithic. I even though from the architecture point of view it might have this microkernel architecture, it's still monolithic from the security point of view because both the microkernel and the, and the, and the subsystem uh, uh, all run at ring zero. So this is all monolithic. So anyway, um, what the user sees are the apps, of course. Some of the apps are more trusted, some of the apps are less trusted, maybe because one of these are software from reputable vendor, maybe others are some proverbial Chinese uh, games. 
or maybe uh, because some applications like a web browser perhaps is not malicious by itself, but it might become malicious when visiting a com complex, complex website that, that tries to use all sorts of kitchen and uh, 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 features that, that, that tries to um, that expose to too large attack service. So, um, so we have apps. We also have devices. Again, some of the devices are most are, are considered more trusted. Some are less, or should be considered less trusted. The GPU and, and the CPU, which I should have also put there, of course, are must be trusted. Uh, other devices, like USB devices, uh, especially um, th th this is pretty vague intentionally. This is not just USB controller, this could also be USB um, pluggable devices. Or networking cards, they also could be uh, not trusted. Perhaps we are buying uh, a laptop made by proverbial Chinese and it has uh, some untrusted Wi-Fi card that we might consider to be potentially malicious. So we would consider it not trusted wisely. Um, but then there's this big thing in the middle, which is the kernel, which holds all sorts of subsystems, like storage and file systems, all the various networking stacks, like 802.11, uh, Bluetooth, TCP IP, etc. Uh, all the various graphics uh, subsystems, uh, which includes things like uh, DirectX or OpenGL uh, API, or just the windowing API. All sorts of other exotic services that, that our imagination can't even uh, imagine. And of course, gazillion of device drivers. Now, the problem is that this, this rectangle also contains the isolation and policy enforcement logic and, and code that implements it. And the problem is that they all share the same privilege, which means all this is actually uh, a trusted, must be a trusted part of our system. This all constitutes a trusted computing base. And this is really problematic. Because say we, one of the apps becomes malicious. Again, it might have been written with malicious uh, purpose, maybe a backdoor application that we have downloaded. It might have been a good application, perhaps a PDF reader, but then it got malicious because it just happened to open a, a malicious PDF that somebody uh, uh, claiming to be Bruce Schneier sent to somebody, right? And then Jan, of course, had to open it because it was 20 minutes before. So uh, <clears throat> now the problem is that the application has this large attack surface on all these components in the kernel, which is like a lot, a lot of attack surface. Should any of these attacks succeed, the whole system gets compromised. Another example. Actually, uh, right now I'm not using my own laptop for presentation, but sometimes I use my own laptop. And when I use laptop for presentation, I also have this slide changer, which is a USB device. It has a dongle that I plug into my laptop. So now I have my laptop, which is my work laptop. I have my work slides. Uh, and I plug in suddenly an uh, untrusted USB device, which the mere action of plugging something here starts dozens of actions in the kernel of a typical operating system like Win Windows or Linux, like involving par parsing the USB device header, looking for matching devices, um, 
assuming this is a whatever type of device, this is a HID device, typically, human interface device, that would start all sorts of uh, subsystems that are responsible for processing uh, user input. But perhaps this is not a HID device, perhaps it's a storage device. Maybe the storage device exposes a partition table that just happens to be malformed in such a way that ex it exploits a subtle buffer overflow in a, in a code in kernel that is supposed to parse the partition table. Game over. Maybe the partition table is intact, but the file system metadata have been maliciously modified, and it will exploit a, a, a bug in, in a um, XFAT subsystem, for example, parsing code. All these examples have been demonstrated in practice. I'm not making them up. All these attacks have been uh, found in, in majority uh, in, in, in mainstream operating systems and have been demonstrated to work. I mean, proof of concepts have been written for them. Um, another example. I'm at the airport when, or at the hotel and want to connect to Wi-Fi network. Uh, I connect to the Wi-Fi network and then my Wi-Fi card that is here is handled by device drivers for this card and, and uh, OI211 and TCP IP stack and, and, and other services like DHCP. Now, perhaps the network to which I just connected might have been sending maliciously modified, modified uh, uh, packets that would exploit a hypothetical bug in one of the drivers or, or stack. Again, such attacks have been demonstrated up to the point where even some attacks have not really required users to choose a specific network. It was just a broadcast, if I remember correctly, packets that were able to exploit and get code execution in kernel. So the, the problem here is that because all these apps and some of the untrusted devices have so much attack service on the kernel. It is really feasible, as we have seen in the past 10 years, at least, to get from these to this uh, uh, big rectangle. And once you are here, it's, a, it's always possible to circumvent the whole security isolation logic or policy in this in this uh, uh, monolithic kernel. Because while these require some exploit, these arrows do not. They are always automatic. Once you are in the Windows or Linux or OS X kernel, the game is over. The isolation has been breached. You can read data from other applications, because maybe here is a, a secret uh, work, confidential uh, uh, document that has just been decrypted by this app. Whatever. Now, this is all because the designers, the architects of these operating systems decided to put all these things inside one big bag that is called TCP. They decided to trust all these subsystems. Should they decide not to, we might just not have all these bad problems. Sure, uh, if this is a web browser, our web browsers would still be exploitable. But my browser would get exploited and the attack would end here. My other apps would still be protected. Because really, the, the hardware isolation that we have on x86, the MMU and ring 3, ring 0 separation, has never really been breached. So it's funny to listen to, to some vendors today who, 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 um, who boast their products saying, oh, we have hardware enforced isolation because we use VTX. That's really bullshit because the good old, CP, the good old x86 uh, inter-process isolation has never really been breached itself. It's through the monolithic big bloated kernel how how the operating system's isolation is attacked, not through the hardware uh, uh, isolation. And by the way, all the isolation is always hardware enforced. So 
That's the problem. That's the things I just said. So let's take a look at uh, uh, the more interesting example of, of our times, which is a typical modern x86 laptop that we all have, right? So um, a typical laptop consists of things like all those things on the picture. Obviously, we have the CPU. We have the memory controller hub, which is also called chipset. Uh, in the past, we used to have a Northbridge and Southbridge, and Northbridge was just the MCH, and Southbridge was for other devices. Today, they, they have been merged. So MCH is connected to DRAM, uh, the, memo the RAM memory, which is not on the picture, uh, because it's a passive thing. Uh, and more recently, uh, the MC8 and chipset has been really co combined with the CPU on Intel uh, into one physical package. And even more recently, uh, additionally, more devices have been combined into one uh, physical pa package on, on, on Intel. So today, when we talk about Intel processors, we actually talk about all these devices. And I think we might even have USB controllers there, I don't remember. So, besides the CPU and the chipset, uh, we have uh, disk controllers, GPU, the graphics card, uh, usually some in, 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 integ integrated uh, wired uh, networking. And usually we have either integrated or not integrated um, uh, Wi-Fi card. Some USB controllers, also some USB devices that connect, connect to these USB controllers like microphone, camera, um, USB ports. We also have audio cards that has a microphone connected, among uh, other things. And we also have something called embedded controller, which is um, some microcontroller provided by the, by the OEM to control things like, like buttons and, 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 and communicates with the keyboard and, and stuff. Now, the problem is all these now are not just hardware, they also have firmware running on them. Well, it's of course a question, where is the line between firmware and hardware? Let's not get into that. And a valid question now is, which of these elements from the picture should we consider are we forced to consider, or should we reasonably consider trusted versus untrusted? So the first question is, which one should we reasonably consider trusted? The other question is, question is, which one are we forced to consider trusted? Because we have perhaps no other choice. Um, That's the problem that if you look at, again, uh, how the vendors, the laptops and the operating system vendors have been acting so far, they have considered all these to be trusted. All of these. All of these. It means any single of these devices has a full authority to, to fully compromise your laptop, which usually means read and write the whole host memory and, and perform code execution on the host, which means subverting any kind of security-sensitive application or workflow that you might have on the laptop. But um, on, on Cubes OS, which is our project, um, of, of, uh, of a compartmentalized desktop operating system that we've been developing for the last five years, we have actually managed to put quite a few of these out of the TCB. Uh, okay, so that's, that's what we did in the architecture document. In practice, we still have these two. Uh, SATA and GPU as part of the TCB. Uh, we were able to do that thanks to a very 
useful technology that is called IOMMU. On Intel, this is called VTD, which should not be, um, which should not be uh, um, mistaken with VTX, uh, which is just a CPU virtualization. But VTD is the device virtualization, and VTD is a technology that has enabled us uh, to put all these blocks outside of the TCB. For example, on cubes. The whole networking devices, drivers, and stacks, they all run in untrusted NetVM. Similarly, we can have a USB VM that holds all or some of the USB controllers, and so also the USB devices con connected to them, and all the drivers and stacks for them. And it's possible to do nice things, such as plugging untrusted storage USB and then doing encryption in and uh, running the disk encryption for this USB in another VM that cannot be compromised by this USB devices. So we can put um, secret sensitive content on untrusted mass storage device, which is nice. But the real, uh, as I said, the SATA GPU could be put outside of TCB. We have not done it so far for some reasons not uh, completely uh, dependent on us. Um, to, to put SATA, uh, this controller, we would need a reliable trusted boot, which is not possible still, as I'm going to talk in a moment. To put GPU, uh, we are working on that and might put it in, in the next major version. But still, these two guys, the CPU and the memory controller hub, or the chipset, is really a uh, pain in the ass. Um, the good news is they are made by Intel. At least everything that you see here, except the BIOS, is made by Intel, which means that if you choose to to trust Intel, which, as you might conclude later in this presentation, might not be such a reasonable choice. Uh, but if you decided to choose to trust Intel, you are fine, mostly. <laughs> so um, I want to explain some, some interesting uh, firmware short uh, acronyms that are here. First, the, first is the Intel Management Engine. Uh, have you heard of Intel AMT? How many of you have heard of A AMT? Okay. Have you heard of ME? Uh huh. So most people confuse AMT with ME, thinking the, these are the same. So they are not the same. Intel Management Engine is actually a little microcontroller here in the in, 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 in the chipset. Its own processor, its own little uh, uh, SRAM memory, its own boot ROM, um, and its own authority over the host processor. So there's a little brother running in your um, Northridge having full access, full authority for your for a computer, whether it's on or off, by the way. AMT is one of the applications. That, so, and ME, besides this hardware, is also uh, the whole infrastructure. The Intel has written their own operating system that is running here. Of course, it's proprietary. Um, of course, it's super secure. At least Intel says so. And one of the applications that runs there is AMT. AMT is like a remote administration toolkit that can be used by administrators to, to, to get access to your computer remotely. It has an uh, out-of-band connection to an uh, Intel Wi-Fi card. So AMT can be disabled, or you can buy a processor that has Intel AMT disabled. At least Intel says so. Um, but ME cannot be disabled. On modern processors, you cannot buy a pro Intel processor without ME because 
there are too many features other than AMT that have been implemented on ME, such as boot guard, such as Intel identity uh, theft protection or whatever they call it, uh, protected video and audio path, uh, Intel SGX, apparently also parts of the Intel TXT I heard. Um, Intel management engine is really a problematic technology. Another thing is ACM. These are um, authenticated code modules that have originally been introduced for Intel TXT, uh, but recently are used also for other features like boot guard. These are uh, Intel blobs that Intel provides and are signed by Intel, which means only Intel can provide them. Uh, and they execute on your host CPU, typically during, during boot. Uh, a similar is of FSP, the firmware support package, which is an interesting uh, marketing move from Intel, because um, you probably have heard about open source BIOSes, right? Core boot, yes. and, and there are all these people that are super excited about getting core boot on x86, thinking that once we have open source BIOS, this will solve all our x86 or most our x86 security problems. Which, by the way, on the next slides, I'm gonna try to convince you will not. But it will not. Uh, it, the, the point is. On modern processors, we cannot even have that. We cannot even have an open source BIOS because even core boot must load FSP to initialize the CPU and train uh, the, the DRAM. <coughs> well, when, when the processor is, 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 is initializing, it must train the memory controller, whatever that means. Uh, because apparently DRAMs today are so complex, there's some complex uh, training sequence required, and Intel FSP is required to do that, or otherwise that probably would not work. So there is no such thing as an open source BIOS, not on modern hardware. On six years old hardware, perhaps. On modern, no. Finally, we have the, the BIOS itself. Of course, having a, a BIOS, like having a BIOS that consists of 90% of open source code and 10% of whatever is inside proprietary blob, still means that the whole thing should be treated as proprietary from the security point of view. Because what the proprietary thing does, it can do whatever, we don't know. The, the again, problem is, uh, Architects of our times decided to treat all these as TCB. So let's assume we trust Intel for a moment, which means let's assume this management engine firmware, uh, uh, FSP, are not, do not have malicious backdoors built in, or do not have really bugs. Um, let's let's assume that. Can we have can we have a trustworthy x86? And also, let's assume there are no hardware backdoors in the CPU, uh, which, to quite extent, is a reasonable assumption. At least because uh, the use of such backdoors would be very expensive to Intel. Because they, if they can get caught using a hardware-based backdoor, like a backdoor uh, in, in, oper uh, in the microcode, uh, that would be just one-time operation. So the cost of use of these would be very high. But management engine, on the other hand, is just, it's just, it's, it's just a paradise for a malware author. I'm not saying Intel is building malware there, but I don't know. They could technically, from the information they have provided, how it works, it's just a, it's just a uh, malware author's dream framework to do that. 
So anyway, let's for a moment consider, uh, let's put all these uh, conspiracy theories aside. Let's assume Intel has created, uh, we, we decided to trust Intel blobs. So we have this boot security problem. Uh, on most platforms, boot security is a simple concept. We have a silicon that loads some boot ROM, which is just called BIOS for historical reasons on x86. The BIOS does some initialization and then loads um, OS loader or the OS directly. Very simple, right? And it gets uh, problematic in practice, though, because Over time, BIOS has grown and grown and became an extremely large piece of, uh, piece of code that probably no single person can understand. It interacts heavily with all the devices during boot. USB devices, other devices, uh, which means the opportunities for BIOS to get compromised are quite high which again has been demonstrated uh, both by, by uh, us and, and others in the recent years. So the problem is that the BIOS cannot, uh, whether open source, whether fully open source or not, cannot really be considered secure. It might be not malicious, but really making it secure is a challenge because of the complexity involved, complexity with the in untrusted input processing. Untrusted input for BIOS would be, for example, untrusted USB device plugged in. Untrusted USB device, we want to keep untrusted. We want to keep outside of the TCB. So we should assume untrusted USB devices can be sending malicious things in response to BIOS requests and can compromise the BIOS. Plus that there are other things. Um, of course, Intel have been originally assuming Intel that the BIOS could be made secure if only it, the, it will be digitally signed and updates will be required to be signed. Uh, and then we have proved this uh, not to be the case back in, in 2008 or 2009. Uh, actually, not using devices, but using other untrusted input that were processed by the BIOS during boot. So, to counter this problem, Intel has come up quite a lot of time ago, about 10 years ago, actually. They have come up with Intel TXT, Intel Trusted Execution Technology. Intel TXT, uh, and they also have, um, in the more recent years, they have provided open source implementation, uh, which is called TBoot. It works that uh, uh, this TBoot code, which we still consider untrusted, because it operates directly after the untrusted BIOS is operating, it does some preparations, and then it executes the magic sEnter instruction. sEnter is one of the new instructions well, it, it used to be new uh, uh, eight years ago. Uh, now it's on, on, ma on many CPUs. So as enter is the, is the key instruction for, for the Intel TXT. Uh, and it, it, it's, a truly magic, it's a truly magical process because it, w w what the as enter promises is to transition from this untrusted computer into trusted, into trusted computer. It's almost like if it was doing a whole reboot of the platform, but without really rebooting it. It's an extremely complex technology. I've been really fascinated by this technology some years ago. And, and, and we have done lots of research on, on it. Uh, because theoretically, it solves all the problems. No matter what's here, no matter what the blobs, FSP or not, open source or not, talking to devices or not, trusting devices or not, whatever, here we end up with a clean system and we can start loading our uh, trusted whatever operating system 
uh, kernel or hypervisor. So I really like that. I really like that because that could be cubes, our operating system. Unfortunately, Intel um, overlooked one aspect, and that aspect is called SMM, a system management mode. It's not like really Intel forgot about SMM because they are quite well aware of it. It's more that Intel um, Inter believed that SMMs once locked because uh, the chipset provides, so Intel implemented special hardware locks, locking registers for the SMM memory so that once the BIOS loads the SMM, it can lock down the registers. So even though somebody might compromise the BIOS later, it would not be possible or compromise the operating system, it would not be possible to modify the SMM memory. And Intel has been, Intel used to believe that nobody can get into SMM once it gets properly locked. Before our research, there have been others who were presenting uh, attacking SMM back in 2006 or something like that. But all these attacks uh, were against unlocked SMM. But then we have presented uh, an attack against locked SMM against Intel BIOS that have locked SMM properly, but we still showed it could be an attacker can, good, can, can compromise it, so can get code execution here. And the problem was of, of this, that SMM survives as center. SMM is one of the things that TXT does not try to consider untrusted. SMM is considered TCP of the of the of the TXT. Again, a wrong trusting decision. Um, so that was when we presented this to Intel. It was 2009 or something. Um, and Intel. Uh, okay, so first response was okay. That was accidental that we were able to get into SMM. Uh, because we have actually exploited some problem in the chipset with some, there was some mechanism, the memory remapping mechanism, and we just exploited it. So Intel's uh, thought was, now we fixed that. So SMM really is still, now is secure. So then we, we, we showed some more attacks against SMM um, that were not exposing uh, using the chipset. Uh, mechanism, but other problems like the security, the software flaws in the SMM implementation. So now the official response uh, for the SMM problem as affecting TXT is the solution by Intel is is this. Uh, so this is called STM. So Intel is now is saying. In order to uh, put this outside of the TCB, we are introducing this little hypervisor <coughs> that is using special dual monitor mode that only task of this STM is to sandbox the SMM and make sure it doesn't do bad things. Um, it's pretty funny because one, 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 one can say, okay, if somebody can write STM, and by the way, STM is also provide, is supposed to be provided by, by the OEM, the, the bias manner. So somebody might say, if, the, if somebody was able to write STM securely, why not they can write SMM securely? Right? And why this additional complexity? But the, um, the, 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 um, the thinking here, which admittedly has some, has some uh, uh, 
is, is, is justified is that STM is supposed to stabilize, supposed, is supposed to be less complex and more generic. So over time, we might get like one good known implementation of the STM that will be proven to be secure. Interestingly, it's been six years now, and I have never seen STM implementation, not even, not, not at least a public implementation. Uh, which is interesting. It's also interesting because without well-known implementation, not only we cannot, uh, like everybody cannot audit STM, it's also not feasible for for the trusted environment that we